I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm based, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So, as mentioned, um, I'm the founder of Sound Scouts, and one of the things that we uh, believe at Sound Scouts is that once is not enough when it comes to children's hearing checks. So I know that in WA you do have the four-year-old check, but in lots of uh, most, I, I guess, actually, the rest of the country, we only have the newborn hearing screen and there's no follow-up testing um, after that newborn check. And, and we're definitely seeing that as a major um, problem. And really, while WA's got the four-year-old check, uh, it's still probably not enough so the hearing screen that we're all familiar with, the newborn hearing screen is fabulous at picking up moderate to severe loss. But as we all know, viruses, trauma, genetic disorders, and of course, most commonly glue ear and infections can cause hearing issues after birth. And if these issues go undetected, they can have significant impact on children, uh, particularly as they start school. So they'll often be picked up due to their academic issues, being disengaged and disruptive in the classroom. And outside in the playground, they can be socially isolated. And for me, one of the worst things is that they're incorrectly labelled. And we're seeing a lot of kids being labelled, you know, as the naughty children or children with ADHD. And often we're seeing that it's actually an undiagnosed, undetected hearing issue. So when these hearing issues are picked up, suddenly the children progress academically, they're engaged, focused, uh, and, and importantly, they can be understood and supported. So I, we just got, uh, we just actually did a, uh, a, a survey of our users. So we're being used in about 20% of schools nationally, primary schools principally, but also in high schools. And we asked uh, our, um, a group of our users to give us feedback on, uh, on the app. And I thought this was uh, a nice quote from a speech pathologist in Queensland who said that we had a child in year three who identified as Aboriginal with significant academic and language learning difficulties. The school had been working with the family to try and access an external hearing test for six months without success. We used the Sound Scout screener and the child failed two tests. We were able to use the screener results to meet with the family and explain the hearing concerns and then to book an appointment with a hearing professional together. The child was diagnosed with severe unilateral hearing loss and received support. This made a significant impact on the child's success at school. So this is a good example of why we've spent over 10 years developing and refining the Sound Scouts app. So it is actually an app. You can download it onto a tablet. It could be an iPhone, an iPad, or a Samsung tablet. And it's also actually now available for Microsoft um, touchscreen devices as well. But you can also, if you want to try it out, you can download it onto your phone. Uh, it's also playable on your mobile phone. We do recommend for it to work effectively, that it's used with good quality adult headphones. If you're testing in a school environment, we don't recommend using earbuds, but you can use um, earbuds if you're testing at home or testing yourself. So the idea with the app is that you download it, you set it up with the children's details, and then you do a short activity, then the child plays three activities and provided the device is connected to the internet, the results will be immediately processed. So you get an, an immediate guide as to the child's hearing health. 
So the aim of the app was for it to be user friendly. So easy to set up and supervise, fun to play. So the children actually love it and they'll often ask to do it more than once. Uh, and of course that it's accessible. So clinicians uh, are not required uh, to, to oversee the Sound Scouts test. We like to think of it as the hearing test that's there when you need it. So I know with some, um, you know, in some situations, uh, it's hard to coordinate and ensure the children and the clinicians will be in the same place at the same time. Well, Sound Scouts is a great way to do that initial screen. Sorry about that binging. I will just uh, <laughs> address that. So in terms of um, the development, Sound Scouts uh, was initially developed in collaboration with the National Acoustic Laboratories. So it is a evidence-based uh, solution. And in fact, our science has been published in the International Journal of Audiology. Uh, hold one second. One moment. Let's just stop that beeping. Um, we tested in the development of Sound Scouts around a thousand children. So Sound Scouts is based on population norms. So we established with the game what uh, what was normal hearing. Well, we didn't establish. We used audiologists to to test children's hearing. And then we ensured that our algorithm compares children's hearing when they play the game to what the norms are for children with normal hearing. We also work with the Hearing Australia and with their clients who had hearing loss to establish our sensitivity and specificity. And for hearing loss over 30 decibels, it's, it's close to 100%. Currently, as mentioned, we've got around 1,800 to 2,000 schools uh, utilising Sound Scouts. And if you can see there in the map of Australia, we've got uptake across a lot of the country. We'd like to see that uptake increase in uh, WA. And so, you know, hopefully when you've had an opportunity to, uh, to utilise the app, you can spread the word. To date, we've done around 74,000 uh, students hearing tests uh, with children and around 24,000 adult tests. Of the tests we've done uh, this year, we've, um, we note that around 8% of testing it has, is being done with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. So, you know, it's, uh, I was recently talking to someone on Hammond Island off, um, off Thursday Island and uh, they were testing, you know, their students there. Um, so we're definitely seeing an increased uptake um, of, of the app um, with communities and, you know, to test children with glue ear and middle ear issues. So the hearing test is disguised as a game. And the reason for that is we want to hold the child's attention. So we want to get good quality data and we don't want it to be threatening. So children are comfortable playing games and we don't, we don't necessarily tell them it's a test. We just say it's a listening game and we want them to listen carefully and respond um, to, to the sounds when they hear them. Several aspects of the game are modelled on play audiometry. So the children listen for the sound, they respond, and then they get a visual reward uh, to acknowledge that they, they heard it correctly. The other thing that uh, the app enables us to do is to collect really interesting data. Um, and, and we're able to share that data back with our users to, um, to provide them with information about the children that they're testing. So in the setup of a test, we, we now ask if, um, you know, around questions around ethnicity. 
And we also ask if the hearing issue has is an issue that's been present for three months or longer. And it's just interesting looking at some of this information that we've recently received. And we can see here for ages, the ages are across the horizontal. So we've just got data for four to eight year olds in I've just captured the data we have data from four to to adulthood but I thought it was interesting to see that um, across all ages uh, hearing loss for three months or more is more prevalent in in children identifying um, or ATSI children we also asked if uh, there were signs of hearing issues and this uh, graph below and across most ages, hearing loss is uh, associated with uh, signs of speech issues across most of the ages there and is more prevalent in, in ATSI children. So that's, you know, just a, a few little things that we're, we're just starting to be able to tease out from the data. And, you know, as mentioned, we've got, uh, you know, we've had around 75,000 uh, test results come through. So we've got quite a lot of data to, to, um, to, to work from. So the, the elements that are included in the Sound Scouts game are a test of speech and quiet, a test of tone, and we use a mid-frequency tone. Uh, we use a warble uh, between 1,000 and 2,200. And then the third test is a speech of noise, a speech in noise test. And what we're looking for there is, uh, is issues around being able to hear in a noisy environment like the classroom. And the reasons for this can be um, due to auditory processing disorder. Um, it can be a, a speech issue, uh, and it also can come from English being the child's second language. Uh, so there's a few, few things to consider when um, the children do badly in the speech in noise component. So when you're going into the test, you will be confronted with this screen, the supervisor setup, and then the player setup. In the supervisor setup, we ask the adults to input the information about the child. The only information that's mandatory is the child's age. So Sound Scouts is an age-based test. Because of the language we use, uh, it's really important to enter the child's age. And I'll show you some graphs later as to um, why that age, um, it, why it's important to enter it correctly. So the supervisor, once they put in this information, they're asked to do a short game-based activity. It's the same as what the children will be asked to do. And it's really important that the adults do that activity properly to the best of their listening ability. Because what we're doing in this first process is calibrating the volume. And uh, it's really also important, as I mentioned up front, that we use good quality adult headphones. So we recommend using the Zennheiser HD 300 headphones. Uh, and, and that information uh, can be found on our website. They're just, there's a couple of things with the headphones that are really good. They don't have a volume control on the lead. So children can't inadvertently change the volume of, of, of their headphones or of the device. Um, they're, they're well cushioned. They've got um, a good level of adjustability and they fit comfortably on, on four to five year olds as well as 14 year olds. Uh, they've also got a vinyl uh, surround so you can wipe them down. We, when we're doing testing, we just take out alcohol swabs and wipe down the headphones between children. So it's also worth noting that the supervisor set up, when you do it, you can, uh, you can use the same setup for throughout the day. So you don't have to redo the supervisor setup for every child you test if you're test testing a group of children. The only time we advise to change or redo the supervisor setup is if the background noise changes. And an example of this would be if you started testing in the morning and then, for example, you turn the air conditioning on, 
then in that case, we say redo the supervisor setup because the background noise level will have changed um, and it will impact on, uh, on the outcome of the results. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's the most important thing to consider with the supervisor setup. We are looking um, at the end of this year, hopefully in time for, for next year, to provide an, an option where if you are using the Zennheiser HD 300 headphones, that you'll be able to skip the supervisor setup. So we, we're looking at introducing this in the, well, particularly for adults who have a hearing loss. So there's our supervisor that as supervisors at this stage um, have to have normal hearing. And uh, so we're trying to build in this option uh, to allow other people who, who may have a hearing loss to use the app. So keep an eye out for updates if you have already downloaded the app, which I hope you have. So the first uh, activity that the children will be presented with uh, is uh, the, the test of speech in quiet. So you'll see those uh, images in, in the top uh, left-hand corner. They're 10 spondee words. Now, to be able to do the test, the children really just have to be able to identify five words in that list. So, you know, you've got football, uh, rainbow, meat pie, airplane, ice cream, eyebrow, and, and it, we have done a, a lot of testing um, and work closely with the team in Queensland. And what they've done, if they're doing sort of whole class testing, they'll just um, run through these words with the class um, prior to test day. That way the children have some familiarity with them. These, these words, along with the, the target items in um, the speech in noise activity, they're also, you can find them on our website under the school resources page and you can just download them and, and you know, laminate them and have them with you or they can be used on a whiteboard. So that's been really helpful that, um, and, and well received. So what I've uh, included here is a graph to just, this is not something that uh, you see in the report uh, but clinicians can get access to our clinical portal and they can see the detailed interactions that um, the children have in the app. So what you're seeing here in this graph, hopefully you can see it, is you've got three lines. You've got the blue line is the level that the adult sets. And I should just say at this point, we work um, in reverse to an audiogram. So lower is better in, uh, in the representation of the Sound Scouts results. So we've got uh, the adult level represented by the blue line, and then the red and green lines represent the children's two ears. And we can see there that in this case, the child, um, you know, we're looking at the difference. One of the measurements we take is the difference between the adult uh, and the child. And we also look at the difference between the child and other children um, with normal hearing. We also look at the reliability of the responses. So I'll show you some tracks later where the re reliability is, is, is not there. So we include, um, a measurement of, um, a, you know, adjusted standard error. And we also look in some of the tests at the number of false taps. So there's quite a lot going on behind the scenes uh, with Sound Scouts. So the second activity is the tone test activity. And uh, the children are simply presented, they, they can hear a little warble and they're asked to just tap the red button. And you can see those little images at the top, each time that they hear a sound and hear, hear the noise and they get it correct, uh, they're presented with one of those little images at the top. So the number of false taps uh, is, uh, and the age are combined to determine how many false taps uh, the child can have. 
and, and we do count those. And there's a point where the results become invalid. So when you're looking at the reports, if you look on the second page of the report, you get a breakdown for the three tests. And if a result is invalid, it will be grayed out. So if that was to happen, when you were doing a retest, you would just be sure to use the trial run activities. It's a, um, the, we present the trial run in the setup stage with the children. And we, we definitely encourage the supervisors to get all children to do the trial run. Uh, and this gives you an opportunity to make sure that they understand the tasks and also that they've got the dexterity to swipe the items. So I've seen children trying to swipe with their fingernails and, uh, and, and this won't work. They have to swipe the, the items or tap the button with the ball of their fingers. So it just gives you the opportunity to check that they're understanding what to do and, and, and they understand the instructions. Um, we specifically um, encourage use of the trial run if you're testing children with cognitive issues. So um, if children with cognitive issues cannot complete the trial run, it's really important that they're not tested. So the... Um, the volume in the trial run is fixed across each of the trials, whereas the volume in the game will go up if the children don't respond. So we don't want children uh, being tested with the app who don't have the cognitive ability to complete the activities. That's really the only sort of, um, you know, I think thing, the main thing to be considerate of when, when you're using the app. Uh, again, here you can see the graph. So this is what we look for when we review the results, when they're coming through, we expect to see, or we like to see the child's responses. They drop down to threshold, the lowest point at which they can hear. And then they'll reach a point where they can't hear the sound and then the volume will go up. So what we expect is just that up, down, right, wrong, right, wrong response. If the child responds very reliably, it will actually end the test sooner. And if their responses are highly variable, then all the presentations will be played out. The next. Uh, uh, yes, so I wanted to show you just a little um, representation of some of the data. So interestingly, um, age doesn't have a huge impact on the tone test results. So that's a scatter plot of, um, of responses uh, across the ages, across uh, on the horizontal axes. And we can see it's fairly consistent from probably for about six uh, uh, up to 35, 40. There's a slight um, dip at the beginning and we suspect that um, that's possibly caused by attention issues with the younger, um, younger students. But so age doesn't have a huge impact on the tone results. Now this will be interesting when I show you the impact age has on, uh, on the speech and noise results. So the third test is a test of speech and noise. And the children are presented with slightly more complex um, targets. So it might be um, uh, blue flowers on a bush, a teddy bear keychain, a cheese sandwich. There's a whole range, there's around 24 items. Um, I, I ha I'm happy to report that that green, uh, green backpack with a red cross on it, which doesn't really look like a backpack, is about to be updated finally and uh, the new artwork will look very much like a backpack. Um, so, so those targeted words, as mentioned, are all available on a sheet that um, can be downloaded. And yeah, if you do have children who are 
Um, you know, English is their second language. It's definitely worthwhile running through those target items if, you know, if circumstances um, allow uh, prior, prior to the test day. It's not, it's not a complete necessity, but it will help with um, minimizing retests. Uh, so in this case, uh, just as an, an example, we can see the gray lines represent um, the, the, the norms for the child of whatever age is being tested. And in this case, the child's results are uh, outside the normal range um, and, and above that norm. So, um, so it's likely in, in this particular case, the child uh, may have received a fail due to speech in noise issues. Now, what's really interesting to see is the big impact of age on speech in noise. So what our data has shown us very clearly, and this is, I think, really interesting, is that for every year from five onwards, four onwards, a child's ability to hear in noise improves by 1.4 decibels per year of age. And when you think between four and 14, that's 14 decibels, that's a significant um, improvement. Now, the reason for this is most likely due to our ability to infer meaning from a partial word. So as our language knowledge improves, our ability to hear just a part of a word enables us to, you know, uh, I guess, make a good estimate guess of what that word might be. So if I go back to the previous screen and we look at, say, or consider that blue flowers on a bush, as an adult, if you look at that screen and you heard blue, blue, or part of that word, you'd be able to see that there was nothing else there that was blue and you'd make a um, educated um, assessment that that item was uh, the blue flowers on a bush. Uh, so, so what we, we know from this is that if children have had um, glue ear or persistent glue ear issues that maybe has impacted their uh, exposure to language, their speech and noise um, results may also be affected. It's also really important to consider this in, in terms of how the children can hear in noisy environments. Uh, so, you know, their ability to comprehend language in, in background noise is going to be significantly impacted because if they've had persistent hearing loss for a, a, a you know a long time, their language development will be affected. So, as mentioned, the things that we calculate and consider in the results are the standard error of both the calibration, the speech and noise, and the tone uh, responses. So we're looking for those reliable tracks. We consider uh, the number of false taps um, in, in the tone test and, and they're assessed uh, relative to age. So younger children are allowed more false taps and the older children are allowed less false taps. We also look at when um, excessive linear trends. So if the children, if there's no reversals, um, then that's also a trigger that something's going wrong. And we also uh, will give a, an indication if the adult, so when the adult um, completes the supervisor setup, we're looking for a, um, we're looking for the adults to achieve a certain level in that test. And it will flag um, if we think the adult has a, a possible hearing loss. And in that case, we'd suggest getting another adult to do the supervisor setup. So if you are in a situation where you have a hearing loss, um, but your, it's your job to run Sound Scouts testing, you can just ask another adult to complete that supervisor setup. Um, and as long as you do it in the same room where you'll be testing the children, that's the most important thing. 
then that's perfectly fine. And if obviously if the background noise changes, you might just ask them to pop back in. It takes about 90 seconds to complete that activity. So it's not, not a big ask. So with the results, the results are presented as pass, borderline and, uh, and fail. And if the child gets a fail result, it, we aim to give an indication of whether it's a middle ear issue, it's an inner ear issue, or they're suffering from listening difficulties in noise. So we aim to give that indication. We aren't always able to um, give a clear indication, uh, but many, oftentimes we are. And it's the way the test has been designed to be able to differentiate between those issues because we know the care pathway for those different conditions is quite different. So what you presented with and what you received, provided you put your email address um, into the test at the beginning, you'll both see this report on screen of the device, but it can also be sent to you. Uh, so we present the, um, the results in a bell curve. So there's that immediate visual indication if the child has passed. But we really, really strongly encourage everyone to read the reports because sometimes in the reports themselves, it will say that, uh, for example, the tone test wasn't valid. Um, you will see that on the second page of the report. But if the tone test is not valid, it is possible that it's an indication of a mid-frequency hearing loss. So that's the first page of the report, which will also indicate if the hearing loss is in one ear or two ears, um, and um, it will indicate if the adult's level is acceptable. On the second page of the report, you'll see the breakdown for the three tests. And with the speech in quiet, we provide those arrows that will give an indication of the two ears. Uh, so um, we also flag that if there's a big difference between the two ears, even if they're in the past zone, that might be cause for concern. Uh, so we, you know, we definitely, you'll, you'll, there's a note made of it in the report to draw your attention to it. Uh, but certainly something to keep an eye on. So, um, yeah, we've definitely seen results coming through. If, if the child responds reliably in the tone test, that, but the results are outside the normal range, it will trigger a borderline result. Now, just be aware, a borderline result is not a pass. So look at those indications look at the, the breakdown of the tone results. If the child fails the tone, because we're using that mid-frequency tone, it can be an indication that they've got a mid-frequency loss. And sometimes the children are able to pass the language components despite this mid-frequency loss. So uh, yeah, definitely it's important to read the reports um, and, and review the results. So as mentioned, we aim to um, break down the, the likely cause, whether it's middle ear, conductive, sensory, neur sensory neural or listening difficulties in noise. And the reason for this is, um, is in relation to the care pathway. With conductive, we're wanting to direct those children to um, the doctor uh, for ENT referral. With a sensory neural, um, we're looking to direct them to audiologists, uh, whether that be, um, you know, community service or um, for, for all these instances, uh, or Hearing Australia or, you know, the relevant body um, that's able to help them in that respect. And then the listening difficulties in noise is slightly more complex. It may be, um, it may be audiology doing an APD assessment, or it may be speech pathology, but certainly uh, we want the educators to be aware that the children are experiencing this issue and, um, and they need to definitely be supported in the classroom environment. So listening buddies, um, you know, sitting at the front, if, if that's the classroom arrangement, um, sound field systems, just, you know, yeah, that improves support from educators. 
So as mentioned, um, we, we recently did this survey, which was really, really interesting to hear um, the different, uh, you know, different scenarios. We've had um, educators coming back saying they've identified children with tumours, you know, masses in the ear. We had one educator say that a child had a pebble stuck in their ear. Um, and finally, Sound Scouts was able to um, alert the parents and, and convince the parents to um, take uh, the children to, for, you know, for, for, for medical attention. Um, 80% of the people that responded did indicate that Sound Scouts increased awareness of student hearing issues. So um, certainly a really positive and strong response in that respect. Uh, it, it does act as an awareness tool. And so it, making teachers more aware, encouraging them to reinforce that BBC, um, you know, approach, blowing the nose prior to testing. Um, and, uh, and also encouraging them to be able to use the Sound Scouts report to engage with parents. So the Sound Scouts report's quite independent. So it's not, it's not um, the educators saying, oh, this is my opinion, but they can use the Sound Scouts report and say, look, you know, this is what the Sound Scouts report is indicating. And it compares your child's hearing to uh, children of the same age across the country. I think one of the, um, for it, the apps being used um, in a number of high schools and uh, it's been really nice. Uh, well, actually not just high schools, but I mean, it's being used across all ages, but I'm um, just thinking of feedback from, from uh, some of the, the educators who are using it, just saying that the children are encouraged to self-advocate. So using Sound Scouts, they explain how, how hearing can be an issue and particularly around fluctuating um, hearing loss. Uh, and, and that they can advocate with their teachers and advocate for themselves that my hearing is bad today and, you know, I'm not hearing so well today. And I think encouraging that really is a valuable life skill. Um, and, and promoting, um, the, you know, this whole buddy, class buddy system. So the kids aren't getting in trouble for, um, for asking their friends to repeat something. Uh, so if we can educate the teachers and make them more aware that these issues exist um, then you know the children can have that support and um, and yeah feel, feel less um, I guess you know less afraid to speak up so yeah that's we we've heard that that's been really well um, you know taken up and received so it's been great to see when we asked schools why they started using Sound Scouts. Um, it, they were able to choose multiple um, responses. 79% uh, said that they were carrying out targeted screening of children with issues. 22% um, were doing targeted screening of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And, uh, you know, 48% they were introducing a new screen, screening program to check students hearing um, across the school. And then we've also got um, new school screening programs. So it's quite, um, quite you know, it's excellent to, to see this, uh, the different uses of, of the app. We definitely on the East Coast um, where there's no four-year-old screening encourage um, school entry screening. So um, well, I think I've covered these. I think one of the interesting statistics that we picked up on that was that 77% of uh, the fail results in 77% of cases, um, they, they weren't expecting the children to fail. So there's this, you know, again, this undetected hearing issues. It's a, it's a real problem. And parents uh, aren't necessarily aware. Uh, people think that, you know, parents are, will be aware, but children are really clever. They learn to lip read. Uh, they learn strategies to work around the hearing loss. Sometimes at home, if they have a mild hearing loss, 
it may not cause major issues at home, but once they're into a noisy classroom environment, that mild hearing loss is going to really impact their education. Uh, so we were, um, we were quite surprised to, to see that statistic come through. Uh, I think I was mentioning, oh, this, the eight-year-old with a pebble lodged in their ear and Sound Scouts enabled the, the school to convince the parents to get an external check. Um, I think this is a nice story as well. A kindergarten child in a remote community known for his difficult behaviour and not listening to grown-ups. Sound Scouts identified significant hearing loss and further diagnosed him with chronic middle ear infections. He had his adenoids removed, grommets inserted, and his behaviour, concentration, and even his balance improved. Um, given that it was an hour's drive um, and there was a long wait list for hearing assessments elsewhere, Sound Scouts was a great way to determine if there was actually an issue. Um, or there's, look, there's many stories like this, bilateral sensory neural hearing losses, um, and um, yeah, I think I saw another one that I haven't included, a response of two children who moved schools and uh, the school, the, the, the previous school had determined that they were, um, they had behavioural issues. And when they moved to the new school, one of the educators suspected that it was hearing issues, had them both tested, used sound scouts, and in the end, both children were fitted with hearing aids. Uh, and the children were so relieved that, um, you know, that someone finally understood what was going on with them and that they weren't just ignoring uh, adults. So that was a really beautiful outcome. And uh, yeah, you know, definitely game changers for, for a lot of these kids. So I wanted to show you, um, I'm not sure who's, you know, there's only a few of you, I'm not sure who's in the audience, whether you're clinicians or um, educators or, um, but uh, just to make reference again to, uh, Sound Scouts has a clinical portal. So we, we, have, we have both a portal for educators um, that allows you to review all your test results online on your computer. So you just need to set up an account. And then when you're doing your testing out in the field, you just log into your account and then your, your test results will be saved both on the device, but also onto, um, onto the account. And um, this enables you better access to the results. Uh, and there's a lot of functionality in that platform. It's called Simple. Uh, there's a link to it on the, um, on the top navigation bar on our website. Um, you just need to sign up for an account and then you can access uh, the, the, you know, all aspects of, of the simple um, the platform. So you can, if you're testing 50 or 100 children, uh, or you're introducing it to a school or a clinic, you can manage all your results and you can sort them by way of um, individuals. You can sort them uh, if you just want to retest uh, the children that fail. So there's lots of functionality in there to enable you easier access and better management of your results. Um, if I didn't mention it previously, it is really important to retest. We do um, have a two test policy, pretty standard screening um, methodology that if the children fail or get a borderline that they are re-screened. Now in the ideal world we'd suggest that you wait um, a day to re-screen. I know in some communities and some areas where you might be testing that might not be possible so what I would say is to don't test the children back to back um, they're going to have listening fatigue. They'll want to get up and stretch their legs. So I would try and have a break between tests. Um, and, and that, you know, that will certainly help with the reliability of the, the second test. If, if uh, circumstances allow, 
I would uh, test, you know, you can test a day later or a week later, obviously recognising that um, conductive issues can be transient. So, you know, they may come and go. Um, but um, if, if you do have the luxury of time, then uh, I would be testing the children who fail or get borderline results in the morning. You want to test them when they're fresh and best able to concentrate. So, um, yeah, so, so that's a little tip there. So when you go into, if there are clinicians in the, uh, in the, in the room uh, and you wanted to, for example, set up a remote assessment program, so someone could be out in the field testing and a clinician could be in the office reviewing the results. So that's what we do at Sound Scouts. We'll, you know, we'll review results coming in from all over the country. And if we see something that's not, um, that, you know, indicates, for example, that the adult level, you know, again, you can see here in this left-hand graph, the, the, the adult level is represented by the blue line. Um, we can see that that adult level is really, you know, it's it's low, it's in a good range, it looks reliable, um, uh, there's no false taps in it, and uh, that's positive, that's what we want to see. If the adult level was up around that red line, that would be a big red flag for us, and uh, we, you know, um, it is noted in the report, um, but we'd also often send a follow-up message and say, you know, please check the headphones you're using, please check that the adult doesn't have a hearing loss. But that's what we do. A clinician um, also has, um, can log in, register for the clinical portal and have access to do that. Um, so in this case here with this result, what we're seeing is a uh, likely unilateral loss where the child's uh, right ear, if the headphones were put on correctly, we know the red um, is the right ear and the left is, uh, so the left is tested first and then uh, the right ear. And so we can see that big difference between the ears. So it's likely this child has a unilateral loss. Um, in the tone uh, screen, we can see that the child and that top, uh, graph. We look for things like this where the child didn't originally, it looks like they didn't understand what to do. So their results of um, headed upwards, we can see the false taps represented by the horizontal lines. And then the child understood what to do, started responding correctly, and their levels reach threshold. And the algorithm just takes that reliable section of the track and, um, and the results would have been processed on that basis. And then the final graph there is just uh, a representation of poor speech in noise results. So this is, again, what you can, this is what we see. This is not what you see when you're just using it um, as a home user or just using the app, but you can get access to this representation via the clinical portal. On our website, um, it's under the school resources link, we provide a comprehensive screening guide. So if you're thinking, well, you know, Carolyn covered a lot of ground today, uh, you can go in and uh, download the screening guide and uh, all the information that I've covered uh, will be, or most of it will be in the screening guide. And that can be shared with, you know, we, we, we share it with schools and um, clinics and anyone using the app. Uh, so things there that were reinforced. We don't encourage the use of earbuds when and used in a public, you know, public context. Earbuds can be used at home, but you certainly don't want to be in a school using earbuds. Um, we, don't, we don't encourage the use of cheap uh, he headphones. Um, occasionally I've seen schools using like the NAPLAN headphones. They're just not suitable quality. Uh, gaming headphones shouldn't be used because they, um, they spatialize the sound, whereas our sound files are very specifically engineered. Um, as mentioned, this was developed with the National Acoustic Laboratories. Our chief scientist, Dr. Harvey Dillon, I'm sure many of you will have heard of him, um, uh, has uh, overseen the development of Sound Scouts and we continue to work with him to 
refine and improve uh, the application. So uh, yeah, the engineered audio in the app has been specifically designed and we don't want it mixed up with or compromised using gaming headphones. So there's a few tips there, but decent quality adult headphones. They, you know, they, we've seen, um, we, as, as mentioned, we recommend the Zenheisers, but I've seen, you know, Beats, Bose. Um, you can use the Audi headphones and uh, some of the better quality Kmart headphones are actually okay. Uh, just, you know, I think around the $20 mark and, and under, they're not, not great. So these are the target word sheets that I mentioned. Uh, they're accessible also on the website, um, download and delaminate and have at your fingertips. Um, they've proved to be very helpful. And then um, I mentioned the simple platform. So it stands for the Sound Scouts Integrated Management Platform. And it's, uh, it's, it's really designed to make, you know, managing the results uh, more, you know, easier and uh, more straightforward. Um, so that's just a representation. If there are audiologists in the room in the next, by the end of the year, we're, we'll also be releasing um, the auditory processing um, diagnostic tools, Listen S, uh, the new Listen U, which is uh, a language independent auditory processing test and uh, the DDDT test. So they'll, um, they'll be available through Sound Scouts um, and that they're the work of, um, or the IP or the, you know, the intelligence behind those is from Harvey and, and uh, Sharon Cameron. So um, they may be of interest to you if you're, if you're an audiologist. Um, if you do, um, if you are using any of the software, if you have any issues, we, um, we, we definitely encourage you to reach out to us and we're, you know, very happy to uh, support you in accessing um, either the, the app or the portal. If you have any issues, we're, you know, we're very responsive. The, the portal is still quite new. Um, it's only been... Um, out and you know being used for about three months um, so you know if you do encounter any issues uh, please let us know but also more importantly when it comes to the with sound scouts and the screening results our uh, our team are there to provide support so if you've done testing and you're not sure how to interpret the results or what the next step should be, then um, we're very happy to review the results. Um, it, it, ideally, if the children have been retested and we can look at two sets of results, that will give us a better indication of what, you know, what might be going on with the child. Um, so I think that's, um, yeah, that's probably covering off on the main issues with um with the app and with sound scouts um i don't know if you have if you're able to ask questions or if you do have any questions um it would be great to you know hear hear from you Karen, uh yes we do have one question i'll just pass the mic now thanks carolyn uh, my name's kirsten i'm from here in australia um, I've got two questions actually. Um, one question I have is if the Sound Scouts website, do you have a list of headphones that are appropriate or do you have specs available on the website so that if we're looking around, we can purchase the right ones? Yeah, look, uh, good question. And, uh, thanks for, for asking that. The, um, the range of headphones is, 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 uh, quite, uh, broad if you like um someone asked me that yesterday and it's it's too wide a list to actually compile mm. because you know there's just so many i see all the different headphones being entered and uh the, the list is endless i'm surprised all these headphone companies uh can you know keep keep uh making money um so uh, when there's so many options but it's really what so what we've tried to do is say look no children's, uh, are, are the cheap quality adult headphones just tend to not be reliable. 
Um, and so, you know, if I was to put a price range on it, I would say anything sort of over $50, you know, and I'm sorry to, you know, define it by, by money, but if that was the simple guide, you just, mm. it's incremental, the quality sort of improves with, with the cost. Um, I've seen, I've, the only sort of, um, I've seen some concerns with the cheapest Sony headphones um, but, you know, there's the more expensive ones are fine. Uh, but look, I think the safest option is if you're buying the Zennheiser HD 300s uh, um, are a good option. The, the, um, I would just say there is a 500 range that I would steer clear of. I think it was an audiological range that was set up to be used with other software. And it's, it's definitely not suitable. So... I think it's the five HD 500A. Um, so, but if look, my email's there. If anyone forgets and wants advice on that, they you know feel free to to call. Uh, I w- I would say as well that you know we definitely work closely with Hearing Australia. Um, so, and you know the when the results are are indicating sensory neural, um, the report will refer and. Um, you know the users on to to see hearing australia so that's been you know that relationship's been working very well yeah um thanks for that and then my second question um i think in the earlier slides you just shared um the map of australia and where it's getting a lot of use and it seems that in new south wales and queensland um i don't know whether that's just due to population but like in comparison because it's quite small on our um, spread. So would you say that the uptake is actually greater by population as well in the eastern states? And if that's the case, are you linking in with the education department? It seems like this is happening in schools. Is there something that we need to be doing over here in WA? Um, and does that sit with the Department of Education or like yeah, what, what are the yeah. answers? Yeah, look, that's a, a really good question. And um, we definitely like to see greater uptake in WA. I think one of the the key issues, as I mentioned, was that there is a four-year-old hearing check, you know, but please correct me if I'm wrong, um, in WA. And I think that's sort of, um, that's uh, seen less uptake um, because, you know, there's this, you know, assumption that the kids have been tested at four and and they're fine, in which case that may well be the case. we have had, so it is definitely population driven, but we've also had some really great advocates in, um, in well, let's say both in New South Wales and Queensland. So in New South Wales, it's been very much driven by uh, itinerant support teachers. So New South Wales education, um, you know, gave us the tick of approval, shared it with the teachers of the deaf, um, and then, and the assistant principals of hearing. There's certain roles within the education department that oversee hearing, and that flowed down to a workforce of itinerant support teachers. So they took on the role of introducing it to schools, and the schools took it up. I think educators are at the coal face in terms of dealing with kids with hearing loss because they see the impact of the loss in the classroom. In Queensland, um, we've had a two year study undertaken by Queensland Education who worked with Queensland Health. Now, the Gail Hemsley and Rachel Beswick, um, you know, Gail's done an amazing job uh, and I work closely to support this um, two-year trial and the idea is or the model that they have um, worked out is that the schools do the screening they've got the option of sound scouts or another solution and the children who don't pass twice uh, health come to the school check those children and then there's a commitment to um, see those children uh, treated uh, within three months and yeah they they did a test in about 16 schools uh, and um, and they're looking to roll that out further next year so that's really exciting 
Then I think you've got that northern, you know, Townsville, Mackay, um, we've got uptake up there. Because of the increase, um, I know, you know, I know a number of the people using the app up in those areas, and I know that they're working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And what they love is the immediate feedback. So they're getting that response and, you know, and they're able to determine if the children have problems. Several years ago, Sound Scouts was approved as a hearing verifier by Queensland. So we also do have a lot of um, uh, schools using it to determine if the child has a hearing loss or not. So I'm not sure if you know how it works, but for a child to access services, they have to determine if their issues are caused by sight or uh, sight or hearing, and uh, and sound scouts can be used to determine if if hearing is is normal. Uh, so you know, and again, New South Wales going back, you've got that regional spread of population, no access or very limited access to services. So they're using sound scouts to as a triage tool, if you like. So then coming back to WA, certainly the way that Sound Scouts could be better used in WA is if we could work with the education department and, um, and we can sort of um, introduce it to schools, even if in the first instance for that targeted screening of children with behavioural or language or development issues, um, and, you know, and then perhaps as a secondary, uh, you know, as a I want to say as another sort of sort of universal approach to screening, whether that's in um, in kindergarten or because you have the four year old check, maybe it's a, a test at age six, or maybe it's a test at um, in year four to identify sort of any of those issues that may um, be related to uh, degenerative hearing loss and age based hearing loss. So yes, I would love um, more support and and um, you know more inroads into uh, Western Australia because I think you know it, it would um, have great impact there as well. Alan. Uh, sorry, I think that was all of the questions that we had today. Um, what we will do is just make sure that all of our delegates receive the website link and contact details um, for Sound Scouts as well. No problem. Well, I think everyone gets a little bit of an early mark, but uh, <laughs> I tend to speak very quickly. Um, but thanks for those who uh, attended and, and please do reach out to me if you've got any, uh, any questions or, you know, we've got flyers that, uh, you know, we're happy to share. I know everyone probably received one, but if, you know, if you, um, for example, you know, Hearing Australia um, offices, uh, we, we often share uh, flyers to, um, to share with GPs and what have you. So if anyone wants anything, please just shout out and uh, yeah, we're very happy to help and support um, your uptake. Thank you very much, Carolyn. No problem. Have a, have a great weekend. You too. Thanks. Bye. Cheers.